put Mary's risk in saying yes to the invitation to carry the Christ child and all that that would cost her in reputation, almost uh, the relationship with Joseph in suffering and pain that she would experience through her life as she watched her son eventually incarcerated, tortured, and crucified. The cost for Mary was high, but she risked it. Today, I want to look at what I think is the biggest risk that Jesus took. And Jesus was taking risks all the time. He was walking into places that he wasn't wanted. He was saying things to people they didn't want to hear. But I think the biggest risk that Jesus took was to take his mission, to take his work, and to hand it to us. To say, all right, it's yours now. You got to do it, because I'm not going to be here. That was an incredible risk for Jesus. And there's some lessons in the way that he did it and the way that it is described for us in Matthew's Gospel that I'd like to tease out this morning as we look at Jesus' risk-taking effort of placing his mission in the hands of 12 disciples and those who came after them. The first thing that I want to call attention to, which is a really important lesson for leaders, and one that many churches fail to apprehend, and that is that leadership is not to be possessed, but it is to be shared. Power in leadership is not to be held on to, but to be shared so that others can become empowered to lead as well. And Jesus does this from the very beginning. We are only 10 chapters in to Matthew's Gospel, and Jesus is giving to his disciples the responsibility and the opportunity to do what he has been doing. Here you go, guys. You've been watching. You've been learning. Go get them. It's like those young adults being sent to clean the bathroom, right? They've seen it. They've watched it. But now, how was it exactly that we're supposed to do that again? You can feel the anxiety rise in the disciples as they're handed this incredible task. Go. Share the good news that the kingdom of heaven has come near. The kingdom of heaven is present in our midst. Heal the sick. Get rid of the demonic. Cleanse the lepers. Make things better, folks. Well, these disciples take him up on it, but it is not an easy thing for them to do. And it's never an easy thing to turn over responsibility and power to people who you're not sure completely prepared, right? And yet, the importance of handing over the power of leadership to new leaders is absolutely essential. If we don't do it, then there will be no new leaders, right? In fact, folks who study the church will identify one of the most important factors in churches that die is entrenched leadership. And usually that shows up in one of two ways. It's either a family or two who have taken control of the church and don't let any decisions get made that they don't like. Or it's a session that has taken control of every single decision that needs to be made from the color of the paint that goes in the fellowship hall to the choice of glassware for the kitchen, right? The whole session has to make every decision. Both of those conditions are absolutely strangulating for the life and vitality of a church. Because people don't have the opportunity to grow into their own capacity as leaders. And so, one of the very first lessons we get from Jesus' risk on the disciples is the importance of taking a risk on others and giving them the chance to lead to fail sometimes, but to succeed other times, and to learn from all of that how to do it a little bit better. 
Leadership is not to be held on to, but it's to be shared. Second thing uh, is that Jesus has given them the same tasks that he had that I'm sure they felt absolutely scared to death to take on. Think about a time when somebody asked you to do something that you weren't quite sure you could do. How did it feel? Maybe a little exciting that you were being given that responsibility for the first time? Maybe a little frightening because you weren't sure if you would do it well or to that person's expectations or approval? And yet there's a sense of power that rises up in you as somebody believes in you and believes that you can do this. Jesus is seeking to empower his disciples and to, to give them, in the words of scripture, his very own authority, his very own capacity to engage in the things that he was doing. So who are these characters then that Jesus is entrusting the most precious thing that he has to entrust, his own mission, his own purpose in life, his own father's work he is giving to them? Who are these characters? Well, it's really interesting to look at them. Number one, um, we start off with two pair of brothers, all of whom are fishermen. Now. I don't want to generalize, paint every fisherman with the same category, right? But uh, when Beth and I went on our honeymoon, we were in a little place that was right next door to a fishing co-op. And every morning when we were sitting out and drinking our coffee, these guys were out getting their boats together and getting ready to go out and go fishing, right? And you could hear all that they were saying. And they were making rude jokes, they were speaking with profanity, they were, uh, they were poking each other, they were ribbing each other, they were, they were making fun of each other for who caught the biggest fish yesterday and all that kind of stuff. They were peeing off the side of the dock into this, you know, I mean, it was just, that's, they, well, that was fishermen. <laughs> James, John, Peter, and Andrew, there you go. You get the picture. This is who Jesus calls. And it's not just that they're fishermen, but that they're brothers too. Now, how many of us can say we've got really wonderful relationships with all our siblings? So into the mix, Jesus brings all of the family stuff of these two families. James and John are called sons of thunder. You can only imagine what that might be about, but at least we know one little piece, and that is that they thought they were special, more special than all the rest of them. Because in one gospel, they get their mom to ask for a special place in the kingdom when Jesus comes into it, and in the other one, they do it themselves. Either way, they're trying to set themselves above the rest of the crowd. Jesus is dealing with power dynamics, with people who want more power, with people who want more privilege. And then you've got Peter, Simon, who was called Pedro or Petros or Rockhead. Cabeza de piedra, if you understand the meaning. And, and it comes out all over the place as we read the Gospels. Peter's thick-headedness, his conviction that he knew best, comes out over and over and over again. And that, that's just the beginning. Then you've got the fact that in this same group, they've got Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. And I'm not kidding. You've got Matthew, the tax collector, identified with the powerful and the wealthy. And on the other side over here, you've got Simon the Zealot, who is politically committed as a revolutionary to kill every Roman he can get his hands on in the same group, walking together, living together, eating together, drinking together, fighting together, talking politics together. This is the motley crew that Jesus pulls together and gives his most precious thing to. Of course it's going to be messy because they are just like us. 
have family squabbles. They have some folks who want more control and some folks who don't want to do anything. They have folks who, who get along well, who have the same political vision, and they have folks who have an absolutely polar opposite political vision. The age range is fairly substantial. And yet these are the ones Jesus says, all right, it's yours. Go and do what I have been doing. It is absolutely astonishing to me that Jesus takes that risk. And yet, in showing us who these disciples are, we discover that maybe it isn't so crazy that Jesus asks you and me to do this today in our time. Because we're just like them. We, we do the very same things. We fail in the very same ways. And we triumph in the very same forms. So where does he send these guys with this new mission? His first instructions are, you guys are to go to the lost sheep of Israel. Don't go to a Samar any Samaritan village. Don't talk to Gentiles. This mission is for the lost sheep of Israel. But five chapters later, Jesus himself is taken to task by a Canaanite woman who shows up and asks Jesus to, to heal her daughter. And Jesus says... Sorry, woman. I'm not here for you foreigners. I'm here for the lost sheep of Israel. And the woman says, even the dogs deserve the crumbs from the table. And you may think I'm a dog, but I'm not leaving until I get the crumbs that I came for. And Jesus discovers faith in a person who's not part of his culture or even his religion. And his mission opens. Because even Jesus can learn something. So these guys go out and they start their mission with the people of Israel. And then they end up unfolding that mission into regions that they had no expectation they would ever end up in. Sometimes if you follow the unfolding development of the mission, you end up doing things you never knew you would be doing. But one of the pieces that I really want to hold on to and share with you today is this kind of unusual thing where Jesus says, when you enter a, when you enter a town, if there's somebody worthy, go into their house and allow them to support you because you're not taking anything, no copper, silver, gold, no belt, no extra tunic, no extra sandals, no extra uh, walking stick, but you, you lean on the people to support you. And, and there's kind of a second miraculous entrusting that Jesus does. He entrusts his disciples to the people and to their goodwill. Even though some of them will be wolves and some of them will persecute them and some of them will hate them, Jesus believes there is enough good will among the people to support his disciples. So he sends them out into this, into this community. And he says, if you enter a home and they are receptive, let your peace abide with them. But if they have no interest in what you have to say, let your peace return to you and go somewhere else. So here's the lesson, friends. Your peace, your peace is in your hands. Your peace is in your hands. Nobody else's. Your peace is in your hands when your coworker is pissed off at you and making your world miserable at work. Your peace is in your hands. Your peace is in your hands when your siblings are fighting or when your parents are on your case. Your peace is in your hands. You can choose it or you can lose it. Your peace is in your hands when the squabbling of political parties has the entire country anxious 
and upset. Your peace is in your hands. You can give it away or you can keep it. That is a lesson I didn't learn until very, very, very late in my life. But it is probably one of the most important lessons of leadership that I could ever pass along. Because when you lead, when you engage in this mission, you are going to encounter conflict. There are people who are going to disagree with you. There are going people who are going to want to do things in ways that you don't want to do them, or vice versa. And how you handle that as a leader is so important. Are you going to let it knock you off your game? Or are you going to be able to find your peace at the center, no matter what? the storm is that is raging in the workplace, in the family, in the street, in the neighborhood, in the country. So just a few little lessons from Jesus and trusting of this mission to the disciples. One, it's astonishing, but Jesus trusts you with this mission. And you are no different from this ragtag band of 12 dinglings that he entrusted his church to, right? We're just like them. We have the same kinds of conflicts. We have the same kinds of power struggles. We have the same kinds of internal disagreements. We have all of that. And that's true and has always been true of the church from the very beginning. But it doesn't have to cost you your peace. And it doesn't have to cost you your ability to still do what Jesus wants you to do. So, share your power. Share it with foibly, fragile, broken people who don't do it right all the time. Hold your peace to yourself and know that God has given you the privilege of carrying the most precious thing God had to give. God's very own hope for the world. Let us pray. Lord, we are clearly not the best gamble. <laughs> and yet you have gambled on us. You have placed your most precious possession, first your son and then his mission in our hands. And we know we have not done it well all the time, but by God, we want to do it better. So do not let us shrink from the challenges before us. Do not let us lose our peace over our inadequacies and our failures. But give us the confidence that your power dwells in us and will, through us, accomplish God's purpose. It is in your name we pray. Amen. <laughs>